my guidance to protégés or mentorees is it's your job to stay in touch with your mentor, not your mentor's job to stay in touch with you. Hello, fellow leaders, and welcome to the Military Leader Podcast, where you can find conversations with today's most successful leaders. I am Andrew Stedman, fired up that you are joining me today and making this podcast part of your professional development journey. You can find this episode and lots of other leader development content at themilitaryleader.com. If you haven't checked it out already and joined the 25,000 other people who have connected to the Military Leader through the email subscription list, and the social media connections, then be sure to do so and become part of the conversation that they're having every day on leadership. This week on the Military Leader Podcast, I am excited to share my conversation with Colonel Eric Lopez. Colonel Lopez is an infantry officer and current commander of 3rd Recruiting Brigade at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Congratulations to Colonel Lopez for taking command last week. I know he's already making a huge impact there. Colonel Lopez is a fired up, passionate leader who cares about taking care of soldiers and developing leaders. You hear him talk about that throughout this interview, and I know you're going to enjoy it. Be sure to check out Lopez on Leadership when you get done with this interview and check out the videos that he's got. He's got dozens of them where he reaches out to leaders across the Army uh, to share their, their best lessons. So be sure to check that out, Lopez on Leadership. And here's my conversation with Colonel Eric Lopez. Colonel Lopez, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on today. I really, really appreciate you taking the time to chat. And uh, I want to ask you, um, really, to start about your, your Army War College experience and, and what that's like. Yeah, absolutely. The Army War College is awesome. I am an Army War College groupie. It is a, uh, it is a great environment here at Carlisle Barracks. Um, we do a lot of fun events with all our classmates. I have really learned and grown a lot um, during my time here. And the other thing is you have time to do what you want to do, what you think is important. There's very few times in your Army career when the Army gives you time to do that. So you want to spend more time with your family? Make that a priority. You want to make your golf game better? You want to um, get physically fit? You know, get back in shape? You have time to do all those things. So I know I sound like a party line, you know, Army nerd right now, but... I will tell you, everybody wants to go do all the fellowships. They think the fellowships are cool and I get to go out and, you know, go to Yale or go to, you know, Notre Dame and do these fellowships. Hey, those are all great. But I'm telling you, if you want to learn and grow as a strategic leader, the Army War College is the way to go. That's great, sir. Uh, That's great. I I found that uh, going to CGSC uh, allowed me to establish an army network that paid off later and you're probably finding the same thing there absolutely absolutely and and, you know i didn't put the army war college on my list nobody puts it on their list it's not cool to say i want to go to carlisle but you know i'm telling you it is a it has been absolutely a fantastic year that's great sir well how do you feel that that's preparing you for uh, recruiting brigade command and what are you doing to getting ready uh, to get ready for that command So I had a unique opportunity this year uh, that I already knew I was going into recruiting. So I really spent the year uh, learning about recruiting. So I hooked up with the local recruiters here in Carlisle. And I have been, you know, when I go to the store, I try to talk to young men and women about joining the Army. And I've uh, connected with the recruiters. I've done tons of speaking events. I helped uh, Dickinson College, the local college, um, get do military appreciation games for the first time. I, I worked on my outreach. I just had all I had this time to to learn and prepare um, for recruiting command, and, and that's like I, I was saying that the Army War College affords you that time to do that, and that's something that I wanted to do because I've never been in recruiting before, and I I, I owe it to my my future recruiters to learn as as much as I can. So I kind of spent the year uh, practicing. And, and learning about recruiting and, and uh, you know, meeting with parents, meeting with uh, doing appointments in the recruiting stations um, as much as I could. All right, sir. Well, after kind of looking into that initially here, what do you think is going to be the, the, 
the biggest difference that you have to consider be, uh, between your maneuver battalion command experience and the recruiting brigade command? It's totally different, man. It is a totally different world in recruiting. And, you know, I tell people like, you know, me taking a recruiting brigade is like somebody taking an infantry brigade who hasn't even fired a weapon. Um, and that's why for me, learning about it is, is so important. Um, those recruiters are out there every day talking to young men and women and getting told, imagine getting told no 10 times a day and how that makes you feel, how that, how that, you know, hurts your psyche. It recruiting is extremely, extremely tough business. It's hard to put people in the army. Only one in four, you know, 17 to 24 year olds, American, American youth can even qualify to get in the army. So finding that one out of four, and then helping them on their journey to get through uh, to join the army is really tough. And our recruiters have a really tough mission. mission. So uh, learning about that, diving into that world has really been a big part of this last year. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. That's fascinating. I mean, it, the, the skill set is, you know, transitions, you know, really from uh, subordinate uh, leadership qualities. You know, we're, we're looking to Typically, we, you know, we're looking to develop the subordinate leader's own unit and how they're leading theirs and, and guiding their people. But here you've got, uh, I mean, it comes down to the recruiter talking to someone who's not even in an organization. That is that is a fascinating leadership uh, challenge. Um, we're going to have to do the, this interview in a year, sir, and, uh, and get your <laughs> thoughts. I want to I hear how this goes. Yeah, it's tough for me to even talk about, you know, the life of being a recruiter because I, I've never done it. So July 12th, when I'll, when I'll take command, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll be learning at the speed of life. And, uh, definitely I'm sure I'll have a different take on everything when I, when I, when I come back in a year, yes, sir. Yes, reality sir. sets in. Yeah. Well, sir, do you know how your, um, you know, your, your vision statement, your philosophy, what kind of, can you set a climate in a recruiting uh, unit? Do you think like, how do you plan on tackling that? Yeah, you absolutely can, but, we're going to do it together as an organization. I am not going to walk in there and say, here's my vision. Here's where we're going to take the organization. Here's my priorities. Uh, we're going to do a, uh, I'm, I'm commanding the Marauder Brigade. So we're going to do a Marauder vision quest literally the day I take command because all my company commanders and first sergeants from across the whole Midwest will be in for the change of command. I've got them for about 48 hours. We're going to do a Marauder Vision Quest, and together we're going to go through operational design, a very cut down, succinct version where we really try to understand our hires intent, understand the environment before we define and shape the problem and ultimately come up with a solution. So um, together we're going to write our vision statement for the organization. We're going to write our mission statement. We're going to write my commander's intent, and we're going to come up with our lines of effort. Uh, as a as a group, instead of me coming in and giving it to the organization. Yes, sir. Is that something you did in battalion command also? Absolutely not. That is one of my <laughs> biggest failures in battalion command. Uh, that I came in and I thought I knew what the organization needed, and what happened was I was giving cancer treatments to an Alzheimer patient. You know, I, I came in with this is my mission, this is my vision, this is where we're going. And it's not what the battalion needed at the time. And during my time in command, I really learned about operational design where you start by saying, I don't know the answer. I don't know what my battalion needs. I don't know what we should do on this deployment. So let's get people together from all ranks across the battalion and just put them in front of a blank whiteboard and just have people think and brainstorm and talk and collaborate. And from that, uh, especially for our deployment to Afghanistan, learning operational design really helped understand the environment, define the problem. And then we went in a totally different direction from what I thought we were going to do uh, on the deployment. And that ended up being just an incredible deployment. But now my first year in command was rough because I came in thinking, I know what the battalion needs instead of let's get everybody from the battalion together and as a group determine where this battalion should go. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If you don't mind, I'd like to take a moment to dive into that a little bit, because I think giving a tangible example uh, will be really beneficial. So, so can you put some details to that? Sure. Um, my battalion had just come back from a deployment, um, and 
I was all about discipline initiative. I was all about mission command. I was all about decentralized and empower. That's how I operate. My battalion needed a basic training level of, uh, of strictness and discipline. PT, you know, formation 0639, 1300, dismiss at, you know, 1700 or, or whatever. Um, that's not my personality. That's not how I operate, but man, that's what my battalion needed. We were, they had just gotten back from a deployment. That battalion had moved from Germany to Fort Hood to Fort Knox. They had just, it just didn't have the stability. A lot of our, our leaders, uh, at the staff sergeant level were, were gone or hurt. And we just needed to slow down and, and just focus on very simple things like PT and, um, you know, just don't get off to the next race. And, uh, and that's where I, I really missed the boat, um, with, with my guidance for the battalion. We're finding a similar thing now as we come back from NTC, uh, and we realize the importance of, of setting the expectations and setting priorities. Otherwise you'll just get sucked into whatever pops up, whatever five meter target it is. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and the, the army's in that right now where we're, we're just, there's so much going on and the pace is so fast that you find units that are just literally reacting day to day. Well, that's fascinating. Uh, I, I'm just, I'm trying to visualize your change of command and, and what kind of formation, you know, whether you, do you bring in everybody for that or are you going to get to talk, to, you know, do it all at once there in one spot? Yeah. So it's, uh, 54, uh, company commanders and first arts across the Midwest, 54 companies, uh, eight battalions. They'll all come in to Fort Knox, uh, for what they call a governance forum. That's where they do a lot of uh, training and team building. And the last two days of that will be my change of command. And then our Marauder vision quest. And that, that vision quest, that I think is a fantastic idea. Um, there's, there's probably room to, to talk about maybe what, if that's, you know, good for every, you know, level of the organization or, you know, or do you think you could have pulled it off at battalion command? You think you, you think you maybe should have gone on that road? And what about company commanders perhaps that are out there? Yeah. I mean, people get intimidated by, you know, the word operational design and there, you know, of course there's an army manual and it has a lot of arrows and stars and it's very confusing. It's really simple, man. Understand your, your hire, your hire's intent. Take time to understand your environment. And all that means is you take your folks, you put them in front of a whiteboard and ask them questions. What's going well? What's not going well? Let's talk about Generation Z. Let's talk about these young people. What do they like? What do they don't like? What trends are you seeing out there? What are we seeing in the high schools? What's, you know, and when, and when you just, when you just let people talk and, and write down what they're saying on the whiteboard, these images will, will emerge. And those images and pictures and main ideas and themes are what you can then take and then really help you understand the environment. And then you can, you can define the problem. So in battalion command, what we, what we found was that because we lived in the, in the Midwest, a lot of people were from the Midwest. And what they would do is the leaders would all leave on the weekends. So the barracks were empty and, and we never, you know, we didn't figure that out that there was nobody there. Um, and the barracks just kind of, you know, was sort of a free for all, but it wasn't until we, we stopped and really tried to see ourselves and understand the environment. Um, so, so the thing was people were coming to the, my unit, which was at Fort Knox, because they were from Indianapolis, or they were from Chicago, or they're from St. Louis, or they're from Lexington, Kentucky. So on the weekends, boom, they were going home to be with their families. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that was something in the environment we did not understand. And then we had to, we had to react uh, to, to once we understood that. Yes, yeah, sir. That I, that's an incredibly powerful exercise. I just can't imagine how many issues uh, and how many opportunities there are out there in, in commands across the army where they're, where they're just on a glide path and there are things underneath the radar that are affecting the formation every day like that. That's, that's powerful stuff. That's right. And it's easy to do. You can do it in an afternoon. Um, I encourage you to get all ranks in there and, and, and really in design, there is no rank. So everyone is, is free to speak. And when you get those specialists and sergeants in there, they will tell you very clearly what is going on and help you see your formation. And then from that, once you understand the environment, the thing about design is you never think you, 
You always think you're going to be doing A, B, and C, and you end up doing X, Y, and Z. You end up going in a totally different direction because you better understand the environment and you've defined the problem, which was totally different than the one you thought you were going to have to solve. Well, let me ask you then, transition a little bit to, to your own professional development. Is that something you had seen in leaders that you've had or commanders over the years, or, or how, how did you pick this up and who has influenced you as a, as a leader that you're using today? Yeah, that I picked up. Uh, my brigade commander, Colonel Bill Oslin, uh, really believed in it, and he brought in a design um, teaching team uh, to teach us design as an organization. Absolutely changed the way we thought and operated as an organization, changed the way we conducted our deployment, and um, it, it very, very valuable. So learning design from from uh, Bill Oslin and, and the team there in 3rd Brigade 1st ID was Definitely formative. Uh, some of the other influences on me, man, my platoon as a Ranger platoon leader in 1st Ranger Battalion in the late 90s, they are the voice inside my head. You know, they are the voice that has guided me throughout my entire career. It's just an incredible organization. General uh, Votel was, was the battalion commander. Uh, General Haight was the XO and the S3. But it was really, it was really my squad leaders and my platoon sergeant that formed me and helped me to think uh, as a leader throughout my career. Um, I'd say the other influential leaders I've been blessed with, you know, my my uh, my senior enlisted officer, whether it's Dennis Earl, my company first sergeant, or uh, John Morales, my battalion sergeant major. Um, I, I've just always been blessed with incredible NCOs to help me with my weaknesses. And, and we always made a, a great a great balance uh, with that. And the last one I'd mention that's influential to me in my growth is uh, is General David Perkins, who just retired as a, the trade out company. The, the thing, he is also the voice in my head and, and some of the things he says, you know, that, that has just shaped me is he, he says, don't give me small answers, ask big questions. And I think in the army, we struggle with that. We, 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 a lot of times focus on small answers and short answers and quick answers, man, in this environment, we've got to ask big questions and, and, and look bigger and think bigger, uh, than we, than we normally would. So those are some of the influencers I've had in my career. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, and in developing that relationship, uh, cause it sounds like there's a, a mentor relationship there with some of the. Uh, some of the leaders you mentioned, how did that relationship form and, and when do you really identify that that's something, somebody you want to be mentored by and then, uh, and then to turn it around when you look across the scope of talent in your organization, how, how do you look for the indicators that someone might be able to develop a deeper mentor and protege relationship? Yeah. My, my guidance to protégés or mentorees is it's your job to stay in touch with your mentor, not your mentor's job to stay in touch with you. So the guidance that I give anybody that's ever worked for me is you should reach out to your mentors twice a year, once in the summer, once at Christmas. Sir, ma'am, here's a quick update. Here's what's going on with me. Here's what's going on with my family. And if you do that to anybody out there, they will respond. I firmly believe that. I know for me, you know, I, I mentor, I'll mentor anyone. And I, I do mentor dozens and dozens of, uh, of, of officers and, and NCOs. Um, but I'm not going to go through my email list and, and email them and stay in touch with them because I, I have so many, but they know if they email me or call me, I will immediately drop what I'm doing and respond with a, you know, if they've got a question about their next step or like, Hey, sir, my OER is coming up or what's, what job should I do? It's immediate. If they reach out to me, I, I, I probably write one letter of recommendation a week because, because I've got so many uh, people that I mentor and now I'm expanding that even into the digital realm as a digital mentor. So I've got, I've got specialists on Instagram that reach out to me that don't know me, sir, what do you think I should do? I, should I go to brag or should I go to bliss? You know, I want to be an 11 Bravo. What should I do? And, and, uh, that it, it's so quick. You can answer and touch people so quick as a digital mentor. That's an incredibly powerful way that I think we need to, to expand our mentoring opportunities in the future. Yes, sir. I, I found the same, uh, after, 
uh, getting the military leader going, I would start to get emails from people uh, in not just the army and other services. I mean, I had an, an airman email me and, and say, hey, I'm, I'm really challenged by my tech sergeant who's you know, doing such and such in the unit and it's, it's driving me crazy and I'm not sure I want to stay in anymore. And so, you know, my, uh, you know, my, my 5 a.m. development hour was now, you know, responding to, to them and getting the opportunity to insert a little bit into their lives and give them some perspective. Um, what that really highlights the incredible nature of the digital professional development realm that we're just tapping into, I think. And you kind of hit some of that with um, when you, you mentioned uh, the online stuff that you're doing. And I want to talk about Lopez on leadership you know, here in a minute, sir. But I, I just think it's it's fascinating how we can start to reach across the force um, and start to uh, start to affect people. I think it really will open up our, our relationships uh, as we go forward in the years to come. Absolutely. And, and that's the only way we can stay relevant. You know, the younger generations are are influenced by what they get on their phone. So let's say the average soldier looks at their phone 100 times a day, which is probably low. Every time they're looking at their phone, whether it's Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram, you know, Facebook, whatever, they are being influenced by someone. You know, Kylie Jenner has over 100 million followers, right? So she is influencing people, hundreds of millions of people every day. Where are our army leaders in that equation? So if your soldier is looking at his phone or her phone 100 times a day, how many times are you as a battalion commander, company commander, PL, squad leader, whatever, how many times are you in that equation of, of influencing them? Um, we've got to figure that out. If we're sending out our guidance on an email with an attachment, we're irrelevant to this generation. The days of the colonel tells the lieutenant colonel, lieutenant colonel tells the major, major tells the, the captain, all the way down. If we're doing that, we are irrelevant. We are not communicating. We have to go from the colonel to every single person in the organization. And that's what social media and digital tools allow us to do. Um, and, and man, you talk about mission command, you talk about a flat organization. That's how we do it. That's how we get, a, uh, get after it in this day and age. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Well, to hit on that, let me think about your battalion command experience, if you would, sir. What? How did you leverage social media then? And then, knowing what you know now, how would you go back and do it? Do it differently? Yeah. So I ran my own Facebook page. Uh, it was it was me. You know, uh, Ramrod Six was my my call sign. Couple things, man. The situational awareness you gain of your formation is incredible. I call it. It's like doing flashcards on your people. So the soldiers and families would, would friend me on Ramrod 6, and I would see like flashcards, like this guy has uh, is married with two kids, and 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 each day you, you'd see these photos coming, and I knew what was going on with my soldiers and their families better than almost anyone in the organization. And it's funny, because I would see that, that young soldier and go, oh man, how's your wife? And, and you got two young boys, right? And, he, and he's like, oh my gosh, sir, how do you know that? Well, because I've been seeing it on, on social media uh, again and again. The other thing it allowed me to do was I, I told all my spouses, if you have a problem, you contact me directly. There is no complaining in this organization. If, you, if you're complaining and you haven't contacted me on Facebook, you have no right to complain. Because I will address your problem within 24 hours. And I'm telling you, not only did I get great insight and, and – um, the, the, the stuff that the spouses sent me was extremely relevant. It was accurate and it was good. I didn't get a lot of, you know, kind of BS or drama or wacky stuff. The stuff I got was, I was like, man, wow, we really do need to take care of that. And, and once I answered one, two or three of those quickly, the word got out and uh, people appreciated it. You know, the other thing is, man, it's positive propaganda. You decide what goes on that feed. So you're always talking about the positive, positive, positive things going on in the battalion, and it, it starts a positive cycle, and it can be uh, it can be very powerful. That's what I found from social media and battalion command. Yes, sir. So what do you what advice do you have for the person who's just had has not engaged in social media in a public forum? Maybe they have a very private life, and um, and what would you tell them when they're sitting there staring at a blank post? <laughs> you know, I think the biggest thing is it's got to be personal. 
it, it's it's fine if you want to have your S1 do it. And, and I mean, but people know the difference, you know, between one that's run by sort of the the PAO, the designated PAO in your battalion, and they're posting pictures, and they know the difference if it's run by you. Um, social media is not is not for everybody. I'm, I'm not sitting here saying that every commander has to has to have their own page and spend all this time. It's got to fit who you are. It's got to fit your personality. It's got to be something you're really interested in because if you're not, people, you know, it's not going to work. Uh, and you're going to lead your organization in, in other ways and in other strengths. But for me, this really it played into my strengths and it was something I was, uh, I felt really helped my organization. So let's, I want to ask you about Lopez on leadership, sir, like where that idea came from and, and the process you've used to get there. Cause it's, I think it's a really powerful tool that's helping the, helping the force. I know there's a lot of engagement and a lot of talk about it. Um, can you give us the rundown on that for a second? Sure. I, I started Lopez on leadership. The number one reason was to learn. My job as a recruiter is to connect with younger millennials and generation Z that, that, that you know, that's who's in high school right now. And I had to learn and I want to learn how they think, how they make decisions, how they connect, how they communicate, what they like, what they don't like. And there's no better way to do that than on social media. And so that was my, my primary thing was to learn. I also wanted to develop a leadership brand for myself that was softer than Eric Lopez, army colonel. You know, I wanted to be, hey, I'm Eric, the leadership guy. I'm Lopez on leadership. So when my recruiters say, sir, we need to get into this college. We need to get into this community. I don't go and approach that college and say, I'm Army Colonel Eric Lopez, and I'm here to deliver the Army message. No, hey, I'm, I'm Lopez on leadership. I'd love to talk to your international business folks about about leadership and ultimately about some of the opportunities in the army. So, you know, I want to be value added to my recruiting formation. Uh, and that's one of the other reasons I, I developed Lopez on leadership. And the other thing is, is, is really to figure out mission command in a distributed organization. My brigade is across, you know, 13, 14 States, 254 recruiting stations. How am I going to really create trust? and create a shared understanding in my brigade. Well, you know what? Social media is a great way to do that. If they can watch YouTube videos of what I'm saying, if they could watch me on Instagram live, my recruiters can see me and, and see, um, you know, the organization at the higher level and communicate back and forth. Hey, sir, Instagram direct message. You know, you said this, sir. I really think it's, it's this. Because I'm so distributed across the Midwest, I don't have the opportunity to walk around the footprint. I don't have, you know, I can go to one place at a time, but with social media, I can be, I can be everywhere and connect, uh, you know, to my form, formation a lot better to promote that, that mission command, that trust, that shared understanding in the, in the brigade. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah. I was just having conversations with, with one of my buddies recently and, and, and how to do exactly that, how to reach more corners of the formation. And we got onto the different apps and methods you can use from, from social media to, you know, internal uh, collaborative program like Slack. Um, and then also to, to Marco Polo. Have you, have you, I don't know if you've seen that app recently. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'm a, I'm a Marco Polo, Slack, uh, group me, WhatsApp, you know, those digital tools we, we've got to use to, uh, to promote mission command in our organization. You know, looking ahead in the future of the army and, and leadership and, and 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 digital media is really just in the found. I mean, in our culture, it's in the founding uh, phases and it's affecting us in ways that we never anticipated. How you mentioned it some some here, but fast forward, how do you see leaders growing up with digital media and being able to leverage it, say, in the next 10, 20, 50 years? Yeah, I think it's the way we, we stay relevant. And what, what digital tools allow you to do is speed the rate you communicate with your organization. You can communicate faster using those digital tools. The other thing it does is it promotes collaboration amongst your organization. So when I was the deputy commander of the strike brigade, the 101st, I had all the company commanders that were under me uh, as an acting brigade commander on the group me app. 
And I told them, if you have a range or a trading opportunity, you need to share that with your fellow commanders. So every day you would see, hey man, hey guys, I'm doing Combat Lifesaver. I've got five extra spots for, for Combat Lifesaver in my, my company. Hey guys, I'm at the range. I've got you know you know six slots for 240 Bravo machine gunners. Send send some people. The other thing I would do is every time I saw a good idea, I would say put it on the group me. Oh man, that's a great tracking chart for your your chapters. Put it on the group me. Hey, that's a great counseling. I have never seen that before. Put it on the group me. And and then you you get flat collaboration. So you get communication, you get collaboration, and what that leads to is innovation. It allows your organization to innovate faster because you're communicating faster. People are collaborating and that allows you to innovate and come up with good ideas faster than your opponents. And that's what we're going to need to do as we go into the future. And that's why social media is important uh, to do that in a garrison environment. So we're used to do it when we we're used to doing it when we get deployed. So I found that it's so easy and I've lived it uh, to to get your organization and focus inward and downward and block out everything else and not reach left and right and not communicate left and right. You know, and at some point, I think in the leadership journey, you know, you're absolutely right. We have to, we have to transition to start looking left and right. Cause the boss, you know, whatever level, he's not looking for the, you know, the, the thoroughbred who's outpacing everybody else and going to win the race. He's looking for the, the one that's going to build the entire group and the entire team and bring them along. Absolutely. And, and this also includes left and right it recruits communicating externally. So we have a we have a growing problem in our army. We are becoming a family business. Increasingly, the only people joining the army are people from army families, and that is extremely dangerous to us and to our nation. Um, we need cognitive diversity. We need people who think differently. We need people from urban areas. We need people from throughout the country joining our army. Right now, increasingly, we're we're we're, we're becoming a southern. Uh, army and uh, it's scary and social media and digital tools are a great way to truly communicate with the American public and let them know this is what the army really is we are not just the special operators that you see in the movies we are everything we're admin clerks we're mechanics we're you know uh, cyber we're communicators we're all these things that the army is all these opportunities the American public has got to understand that, or, or we're gonna we're gonna lose touch with our our uh, with the American public and the people that support us, and that that's dangerous. Yes, sir. Looking back over your career, um, what has been impactful for you, professional development wise? What resources do you go back to, and that you recognize have shaped you over the years? I think the the key that has that has really shaped me and helped me to grow is reflection. And listening to all different types of outlets, whether it's speakers, whether it's podcasts, whether it's um, uh, you know blogs, stuff on the on the on the web, you know, from the Green Mill Company leader, military leader, War on the Rocks, articles. It's great to listen to all that, but when do we really reflect on what all those things mean to me? and internalizing it and taking it over. So this is a place where social media is great to get the input, but then we got to turn the social media off and really sit in quiet and think and reflect. And that's where original ideas come up and that's where initiative comes up. Um, so I think there's been many, many professional development resources, but the real impact comes when you take time to reflect and, and, really understand how those affect you and your organization. And that's where writing it down by hand, I think is, is so critical. And, and then going back and reflecting on what you wrote. Mm -hmm. So, so what does your routine look like when it comes to that? Do you have a journal or do you use a digital tool? How do you, how do you capture? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm old school. So I, I write things down in a, in a notebook. That's sort of like my scrap notebook. And then I have like my money green notebook where after I go a week or two, I'll go back over my notes and really reflect on what is the one or two takeaways that I've really learned. And those things go like really, you know, I use my good handwriting and write those in my kind of my reflection notebook. 
I actually did a video on this on, on Lopez on leadership. So how to use your green notebook to be successful. Um, and, but that's really, you know, kind of what I talked about. And that's, that's kind of my technique. Yes, sir. And, and is that, uh, is, is that time that you set aside uh, is in the morning or you, you know, when do you carve out time to, to do this? <laughs> I'm definitely a morning guy, but um, my mornings are usually full. I'm trying to get my uh, get my Bible study done and kind of get get my PT in. I honestly do that in boring meetings and classes when I probably should be listening to something else. That's that's when I'll kind of take a couple of minutes to sort of uh, reflect on. Uh, and, and I definitely did that when I was in the war college, but now. You know, in command, I'll probably be running the meeting. So if they're boring, boring or irrelevant, it's probably my fault. I think I'll probably do it when I travel um, in command. It'll probably be when I, you know, you're kind of in the airport waiting for the flight. And that's when you can take a few minutes to, to really reflect. Oh, yeah, sir. You're going to get some great podcasts and audiobook time there in that job. Absolutely. Let's talk about Army and the, and the family uh, for a second here because the continuing challenge and, and it's been this way for a while and it's not going to anytime soon, I think, is how you balance the needs of the Army and the family. What, what's been your approach and, and how have you handled that over the years? Yeah, I, I do not struggle with balance. I am not. I don't have a problem with that. I go home when it's time to go home. I, I, I shoot for I'm a 1700 kind of guy. Um, the ways to to make that happen in your organization is one, you cannot play the whose car is in the parking lot the latest game. Working later does not mean working better. You know, again, another another general Perkinsism. Don't confuse doing a lot with getting a lot done. Um, and it's funny you'll go to an organization where people brag about working late, and I immediately stomp that out. And I immediately tell that person, well, clearly you can't get your work done, you know, in the right amount of time and you need to fix yourself and the organization, you know, will change, change quickly. Um, as leaders, we need to put in forcing functions to make what we're saying come true. So what are the forcing functions we put in to instill balance in our organization? Um, are you walking through at 1700, kicking people out? Are you, when you sit down with counseling, are you talking to people about their families and spending time with their families? And what are you doing on vacation? Are you locking in and protecting those leave times? When you do that as a leader, then balance becomes, becomes real um, and, and it becomes a priority. So that, that, those are kind of my, my thoughts on balance in the, in the Army. Yes, sir. Did, did you find that subordinates or uh, you know your team is resistant to that because they they just don't believe that it can actually can actually happen? Was it was it tough to continue or to reinforce? I mean, it's up to them, man. I'm gonna be at home because I like you know I people who don't like people who like to work late. I always kind of question: Do they really want to spend time with their family? I want to spend time with my family. So if you want to stay late, I'm not gonna micro man. I'm not gonna micro manage you. You know. Um, but I'm going home. So, and I think once people see the commander going home or the three going home, then they go home. <laughs> you know, I always say nothing gets done past 1600 anyway. The amount of BSing that goes on after 1600 where people are just kind of walking around, sitting on people's desks, oh, you know, BSing about how they work late all the time, they're not really getting it. If you work hard from PT, you know, work through lunch, man, you're smoked by 1600. You can't, you're not coming up with original thoughts. It's at 1630 when you've been grinding all day long. The other thing is I, I, I come in early, you know, if your family's asleep, you're not taking time away from your family. If you come in at 435 AM, you know, then great. Then go home 16, 1700. Um, those are just some of, some of the, my, my tricks. And, and again, I'm a morning person. That's kind of how I, how I operate. Yes, sir. That's been one of the challenges uh, that I've continued to try to refine here in command is finding the time, um, and not just the, the time to work, but the time to be creative or to the, the time to, like you said, reflect, you know, when does that happen? And then once that day gets going, then, uh, I mean, you get, you start getting pulled in every which direction, even if you do have a battle rhythm. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. The morning time is when the, the, the best thinking gets done. I, um, and you know, I, I read a, uh, when I was a cadet actually, um, 
I, I read an article called How to Rein in Your Inner Workaholic, and it was in an Air Force you know, quarterly magazine, and it was by a, a, a new squadron commander uh, who is basically bragging to himself about how late he stayed and then realized that over the weekend while he was at the office, his boss came, came by the house and had asked, hey, where's, you know, where's Bill at? And the wife said, oh, he's at work. And you know, so he was proud about that until his boss brought him in on Monday and said, hey, hey, man, if you can't get your work done during the week, then just like you said, sir, you know, you're not – you're not as good as uh, you think you are. Uh, and the, the, the takeaway at the end of that article was really profound. It said, you know, no amount of professional success can make up for failure at home. And that, that has, that has rung true or, you know, it, it rung in my ears really since I was a cadet. Absolutely. And, and I know people are going to listen to this and kind of call the, the BS flag on me for, for what I'm saying. And this goes to one of the things I think army senior leaders need to do and one of the mistakes we're making as army senior leaders and that is who is going to say no who is going to say no my organization's not doing that as the 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 two star sends it to one star one star sends it to the brigade commander you know it's inside the 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 training lock-in who's going to say no is it the two star is it the colonel is it the battalion commander is it the company commander Somebody, man, the pace our army is running at right now is insane. But somebody has got to say no. Somebody with some rank. And people are hesitant to do that because we are designed to, hey, we accomplish the mission no matter what. But but we're getting to the point now where we are sacrificing our soldiers and families because we as senior leaders, me included, are scared to say no. So we have, that's one of the things Army senior leaders have got to do a better job at, at the colonel level, all the way up. One final thing I want to kind of ask you about, sir, and that's what advice we have for those company commanders and first sergeants out there who are overwhelmed uh, and all those tasks and all those, you know, quote, priorities come down the pipe and they land at the company level for execution. You know, what, how, how, do we, how do we help them sort that out um, if, we, if we can't say no? Right, right. A couple of things. <clears throat> one you can't, you have to keep resisting. You have to keep fighting to have a calendar that is real, a calendar that is based in fact. Um, a couple ways to do that. Number one, you have to be in front of your higher headquarters. So if your battalion is, is six to eight weeks out as a company commander, when it comes to those key events, you've got to be much deeper. So you're coming to your your battalion before they're even thinking about it going, man, do not touch my range week right here. I've got it planned. I've got a resource. I've got the ammo. I've got, I've got, you know, the trucks. I've got air, air planned. I've got everything. Don't touch my week. Because if you're doing that and you're, you're out in front of your peers, they're going to give the taskings to your peers. So your calendar has got to be so good that you are out in front of your higher headquarters. Number two, you've got to have an internal red, amber, green cycle to protect the time. So when that last minute tasking comes down, don't give a piece of it to every platoon. You have your 911 red platoon. They might have training planned, but they know if we get a last minute tasking, you're the platoon that's getting tapped for that because we're going to protect this platoon, third platoon, you know, and then it, and then it rotates. So the next time it happens, then second platoon gets the, the priority for training. So, but man, to, to do those things, you cannot just give in to being reactive and just going week to week and changing, changing, changing. You have to resist. It takes an incredible amount of time and mental energy to truly execute training management at the company level when maybe your battalion or brigade isn't even doing it. It can be done, um, but it's hard. It's really hard. There's a continuing conversation here that we could go on for probably an hour just about that topic alone. Um, but uh, um, before we go, I do want to uh, give the opportunity to, to let us know uh, where we can find Lopez on leadership and some of the other good work you're doing online, sir. Absolutely, man. Let's keep, keep it simple. It's Lopez on Leadership on Instagram, on Facebook, and on YouTube. Uh, it's all this all the same handle. 
Uh, love to connect with people. Love to get your thoughts. I just ran hashtag branch series. So I interviewed former battalion commanders, future brigade commanders from every branch here at the, at the war college. So day one was infantry. Day two was armor. Day three, field artillery all the way through. Um, so, so check that out. If you want to hear from, uh, army senior leaders on their number one leadership tip, uh, great leaders they worked for, their advice for cadets, their, their expectations of their junior leaders, and then specifically their expectations and advice for junior leaders from their branch. Uh, tune into that hashtag branch series and you can find that on my uh, YouTube channel. Yes, sir. What a great idea. That's, I love how it's tailored uh, for each branch and, and they have their own niche that they can just dive into. Um, there's some great content there. Sir, I want to thank you for taking the time uh, to share your lessons and insight uh, with the military leader audience. Uh, tons there. I know they're going to get a lot out of it, and I really appreciate you taking the time, sir. Absolutely. It was a, it was a blast. Drew, thanks for what you're doing, and look forward to talking again in the future. All righty. Thanks, sir. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Colonel Eric Lopez. Thanks so much to him for taking the time to share his lessons with the military leader audience. It is so important to have good leaders in charge of turning America's best citizens into soldiers. And congratulations to him again on taking command in 3rd Recruiting Brigade. We look forward to seeing the incredible impact that the Marauders have on increasing end strength for the Army. All right, for next time on the Military Leader Podcast, I am looking forward to sharing my conversation with one of the most respected and talented NCO leaders I've ever seen is Command Sergeant Major Scott Schroeder. Command Sergeant Major Schroeder retired last year in 2017 after 34 years in the Army, 66 months of which was spent in Iraq and Afghanistan leading soldiers in combat. He held every significant NCO leadership position, including Command Sergeant Major of the 101st Airborne Division, Command Sergeant Major of 3rd Corps and Fort Hood, and then finally before retiring as Command Sergeant Major of U.S. Army Forces Command, a four-star command. I got to work with him in 2013 when he was the Command Sergeant Major of the ISAF Joint Command in Kabul, and I'll tell you that no one has gotten out on the battlefield more times than Command Sergeant Major Schroeder. He was never in the headquarters, which means he was out with troops, checking the line across the country, and spending time with the folks that really matter. I really got to hand it to him. I, I, he set an incredible example. I learned tons of lessons from him, and I'm really excited about sharing my interview with him. So be sure to look for that next week. I want to thank you for listening to the Military Leader Podcast. If you haven't subscribed already, head over to themilitaryleader.com. Click that big, big red button there and so you can get notified by email whenever there's a new podcast or a blog post. Thank you for listening and lead well.